Hey, everybody, it's Charles Hoskinson. Can everybody hear me all right? Make sure the gain is up on my mic. Okay. And let's go ahead and allow that. Okay, so I should be on my Yeti mic. Yeah, guys, just let me know in the comments if you have any trouble hearing me. Uh, other than that, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, uh, so I'm traveling to South Korea tomorrow, and I'll be there for a little bit. And then after that, I'm heading to Japan. So as traveling is hard and internet is sparse at times, I figured I'd do an AMA for you guys before I, uh, I run off to uh, you know somewhere far, far away. And it's not clear when and how I would be able to do another one of these AMAs. Uh, but I really do enjoy them. I love the questions that I get. And actually, I get asked a lot of questions out of band. So uh, I mentioned in the title, uh, bonus questions. So there's a few questions that people have pre-asked that I'd like to go ahead and address first. And actually, I should ask answer more than just Cardano-related questions or IOHK-related questions. There's some lifestyle questions and questions about me, and I figured uh, it'd be kind of fun to go into a little bit of that. Okay, so uh, the first question comes from a user uh, in Germany uh, who asked about uh, how do I run a company, travel hundreds of days a year, and deal with uh, all the stress? You know, what is what's the lifestyle like? You know, what's a day in the life of Charles and uh, I had to think about how to answer that question for a little bit, but I thought it'd be kind of a little fun. Uh, so nowhere in my life history or how I was raised was I really prepared to deal with the stress. I come from a family of doctors and uh, they deal with it by becoming workaholics and getting gout and gaining weight and uh, not exactly the healthiest of lifestyles. Uh, and uh, I basically committed every sin you can as a CEO. I, uh, I overworked, over ate, uh, got gout at 27. and um, certainly didn't sleep enough. And as I've gotten older, and especially as I, I read more and more about lifestyle and uh, health, I really have started taking such things seriously. Uh, you can only get gout so many times before you realize that you're not getting any younger. Uh, so a uh, few things that I've started incorporating into my lifestyle that have really helped me. And uh, if anybody who actually wants to become an entrepreneur, uh, it's uh, definitely something they should consider. Uh, first off, I went from 180 pounds to 240 pounds, uh, so well over 100 kilograms. And uh, I did that in just a four-year period. So I realized the trajectory was leading me to 300 pounds, and I was probably going to kill over at 50 of a heart attack. So I had to do something to manage the weight. One of the biggest problems of weight management uh, was the fact that I was never in the same place and never was the same cuisine at the same time. Uh, so I was with this conundrum where even if I could commit to a stable diet, it's really hard to commit to that when you're on a plane or in Vietnam or Korea uh, or Australia or Africa. It just, everything changes. Uh, so I read a lot of work from Dr. Fung, and uh, he's a nephrologist up in Canada, trained at UCLA, and Dr. Fung recommended intermittent fasting. So I decided to bring that into my lifestyle about six months ago, and I went from my peak 242 pounds to about 220 pounds. And so I've lost 22 pounds since I've done that. And I feel a lot better. The only meaningful change has been going from eating whenever to eating within an eight-hour window every day. So I don't eat for 16 hours, and then I eat for between usually 12 and 8. Uh, also, I've been trying to get to a ketogenic diet. So that's a diet mostly based on fat and protein and not much carbohydrate. Uh, and uh, I've had varying degrees of success there. It's easy to get into ketosis when you fast, and I noticed much more mental clarity. In fact, the longest fast I've done so far, I didn't eat for a week. It was when I was over at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign with the runtime verification team, and they were quite generous in going to great restaurants while I ate nothing. So I got to watch sushi and uh, uh, wonderful steak and barbecue being devoured in very Midwestern fashion while I enjoyed my water. Uh, but that was a great experience. Um, the second thing I've incorporated into my lifestyle has been mindfulness meditation. In fact, I have a device that I bought, which is really cool, and I'll show you guys. I've been using it recently, and it's tremendously helped. Uh, so this right here is something called a Muse, and I'm always a big fan of technology. Uh, but basically what it is is an electrocephalograph, and you put it on your head, and it what it does is it can read your brain waves, and it connects to a cell phone application, uh, and basically what it does is it lets you know when you're in a calm state and when you're in an active state. So it's a meditation aid that gives you a feedback loop of when you're calm and when you're not. 
And that's one of the biggest problems when people practice meditation as beginners is they're not quite sure if they're doing it right and an instructor can't get inside your skull and let you know, uh, unlike a martial art where they can actually watch you do something, they can't really know. So it's really hard to find those moments of clarity, whereas this device can get in your head uh, and uh, it's been a tremendous aid. The other thing I've tried doing recently is uh, isolation tanks. Uh, there's, uh, it's called flotation therapy. So you just go into a pitch black, completely soundless tank and you float in salt water that's denser than the water in the Dead Sea uh, for 60 to 90 minutes. And uh, you basically reach this beautiful state of calm. In fact, it's the most weightless you can be without actually being in space. So since I started doing that, I've noticed I've started sleeping better, feeling a heck of a lot better and being a little bit calmer. Uh, the final issue is the stress of being constantly criticized and attacked. I kind of have sometimes a thin skin, and you might have noticed on Twitter or Reddit, uh, and nothing really prepares you for that. And I was used to being in an environment where I had close personal relationships with people, and unfortunately, uh, as I've become an entrepreneur and more globally known, uh, I don't really have those close personal relationships with most of the people who follow me. And I've noticed that there's a profound lack of empathy and a profound lack of understanding uh, amongst the general public when things aren't going their way, uh, especially as the price of cryptocurrencies go down. Uh, so it's been uh, it's been a bit difficult to deal with uh, with that factor, the emotional factor of um, how do you deal with constant criticism every day. Uh, but I found that as I meditate and I found that as uh, I get older, it's become easier and easier to deal with these things. And uh, also having a good team of people around you really helps a lot. So those are some lifestyle changes that I put in and they've certainly helped me a lot and I feel a lot better. Um, and I think maybe I can do this job a bit longer because of it. Uh, and I'd recommend any entrepreneur uh, do that. But you know, there's actually a lot of great lifestyle blogs and podcasts. Tim Ferriss has some really good ideas as does Joe Rogan with his guests that can constantly come on. And uh, I've read some great books like Stealing Fire and uh, another book called How to Change Your Mind from Michael Pollan. Uh, so there's, uh, there's certainly great literature out there. And if a person actually wants to focus on this topic, uh, there's a wealth of great resources. As with all things, do your own research. And I am not a doctor. So, uh, you know, proceed with caution and care and requisite professionals. But at least that's what works for me. I'll continue experimenting and I'll periodically let you guys know uh, if it's working. You probably can tell if I gain weight or lose weight, if I look healthier or not so healthy uh, based on that. So there's a great trial and error, at least uh, for me. Uh, final point, I, I found, especially doing a lot of research and talking to a lot of doctors, uh, that there is a just a tremendous amount of good research saying that if you get your gut right, uh, it helps you. I suffer from acid reflux and uh, a few food allergies here and there. Uh, and uh, I've noticed when I take probiotics and prebiotics and uh, I try very diligently to get my microbiome where it's at, I feel a heck of a lot better, and especially mentally a heck of a lot better. So uh, there's some books like The Good Gut and uh, Grain Brain from Dr. Perlmutter and others that talk about this a lot. And I'd highly encourage anyone who's having health problems, especially immune problems, to maybe spend some time on their um, on their immune system, on their microbiome, because that, if at the very least, probably can't hurt you, and might actually provide some help. For me, it provided a lot of help, especially given the cuisines I deal with. Uh, so that's how I deal with the the stress of running a good company. Um, now, actually, it's kind of an interesting thing if you look at Elon Musk. Um, one caveat to being an entrepreneur and running a company is it super important to have people in your organization uh, who can say no to you and can say maybe you should try something else. If you're king and you live in a basically a cult of personality and you have lots of people that boost you up, uh, you know you may have lower stress because you think everything's going your way, uh, but you're prone to amplify the mistakes that you make. And if you look at the governance of Tesla, for example, there really aren't many people around Elon who can say no to him or say, maybe you shouldn't have sent that tweet or something like that. The advantage we have at IOHK is I have a co-founder with equal power, Jeremy Wood, both owning the same amount, and his job is to be a professional critic. Uh, so a lot of decisions I make at least go through him. There's a kind of a sounding board there, and we have layers in the company where things take time to percolate. If I really want to do something, I have to push pretty hard to get it done. And there's a lot of pushback 
Um, so I'd highly encourage people to create these types of environments because they avoid echo chambers and they really get you into the mindset that you are flawed and you can make mistakes and your first try is seldom the thing that you end up doing. Okay, so there was another question I got um, out of the UK and uh, it's one that I, I'd like to spend a little bit of time on and it was about peer review. Uh, so there's a perception that peer review slows down the development process and uh, that in this hyper-competitive cryptocurrency space that somehow if we involve this, this process-oriented, very disciplined way of doing things, uh, that we'll somehow miss out on great opportunities and we'll somehow miss out on our ability to you know, uh, catch ahead and beat the incumbents in the marketplace. And there is a certain degree of truth that you know, in the tech space, if you move too slowly, uh, you're going to get clobbered. But I think it's incredibly important to differentiate the development of software from the development of protocols and scientific endeavors. Protocols don't come along very often. You know, you see the big ones every now and then. You have like the BitTorrents and the TCPIPs and so forth. And when they come out, uh, they have a profound influence and they end up getting adopted and used. You know, things like PGP have been around since 1991 and it's still used. I have Mailvelope, a lot of people use it. Uh, so you'd have to ask yourself, okay, why should we then constrain the development of something that could be around for decades to the same forcing factors that we would look at with a cell phone application uh, or with a web application? You know, in one case, it's all about market share and it's all about experiences and minimum viable products and getting things out as quickly as possible. And in the other case, it's all about saying, I'm leaving something behind that potentially my grandchildren might actually be using as developers. And if I screw it up, every mistake I make, uh, they're going to have to live with because of legacy reasons and momentum and so forth. Uh, so we differentiate between those two aspects at IOHK. On the software side, we have not done a great job at moving as quickly as we need to move. And uh, we're constantly vigilant of that. We have competing teams and occasionally some get ahead of the others. And that gives us a lot of lessons on how we need to refactor and reform our processes. And it's a big focus of ours for the second half of the year is to ask ourselves, how do we write faster, more collaborative, more open software in a more agile way? Uh, and uh, this is part practice, part of science, part opinion, part objective. And there's a lot of do's and don'ts there. But on the science side, on the protocol development side, really you start with a great team. And that team is composed of people who've been doing that for a long time. And they've made big mistakes. And they've seen big mistakes. And they're real good at literature review. And they're real good at borrowing from their competitors and from other teams. And then you build in checkpoints that allow you to review if what you're doing is correct uh, or not, or if you've actually solved the problem or not. And there's many types of checkpoints. There is the peer review checkpoint, there's the formal specification checkpoint, there's the prototyping checkpoint, and there's actual deployment in uh, industry checkpoint, and then viewing what competing protocols can accomplish. Um, so as with all things, it's really hard to build a team that can move quickly when you have to move in a very methodical way. And uh, we've been inspired from companies like Microsoft Research and from DARPA and other uh, think tanks about how to actually move quickly. Uh, yeah, we're, at, we're at the same time preserving our principles. It's obviously imperfect, but actually if you look at the productivity of the Ouroboros team as the case study, or the Plutus team as a case study, uh, we're moving as faster, faster than our competitors. In fact, in our opinion, we feel we're ahead of Casper. And in our opinion, we feel that our PL group is producing some great work. Uh, where we're slower and we need to speed up is on the translation from the prototype into production and into our systems. Our release cycles are just simply too long. Our QA process simply takes too long. And uh, we have some project and product management failures there that we will focus on and we'll overcome. But reality is that we're a relatively new company. And uh, you know a lot of these things have never been done before and quite in the way we've done it. We operate in 16 countries. We're very decentralized. And there's a price to that. And you have to kind of learn a methodology that can work in these new types of environments. We don't have the luxury of a really tightly focused Silicon Valley startup. But on the other hand, we do have the luxury of being able to hire the most brilliant people because we can hire pretty much anywhere. And it turns out when you're a savant, you can go live in Bali and find gainful employment. 
whereas uh, you can't simply do that if you're your average college critter. Uh, so uh, I don't think we're slowed down, but I do think we can do a better job. The other thing is that I don't think there is as much of a rush as people realize. As we see with the contraction of the marketplace, as I mentioned in my prior video, the market is coming back to a normalcy, coming back to rationality. You cannot go from $250 Bitcoin to $20,000 Bitcoin, where the foundations, the fundamentals of the space haven't materially changed too much, and then have an expectation that that's a stable equilibria. It's going to go back down, uh, and there's going to be a recession, and weak hands are going to come out. And what's going to happen is the same thing that's happened anytime you have a contraction in a very exciting marketplace. The people who really believe in the technology and the people who really believe in what the technology can do for humanity stick around and they continue to work hard, if not harder, because now they have more scrutiny and now they have more demand on them and less resources to work with. And the people who are just in it for a quick buck, they tend to disappear into the ether. Uh, so just like the dot-com collapse, uh, I feel that our industry is much the same way. Now, the advantage of this increased scrutiny is that we're going to have really strong conversations about, well, how should we as an industry write protocols? And where have we done a good job and where haven't we done a good job? As with projects like Avalanche, um, the Stellar Consensus Protocol, Tendermint, uh, Snow White, uh, these types of things, I've been fairly impressed with the progress, the process, the methodology, the blending of open source, kind of bizarre style uh, philosophy with the cathedral style peer review philosophy. And for the most part, actually, I think that uh, the protocol development of our space is actually pretty good, not from the big guys, but from the smaller guys. And there's just a heck of a lot of cool innovation and interesting things going on. So there's a lot of great case studies to learn from there. But it's important to understand that to build a good protocol is about a three to five year endeavor. We've been working on Ouroboros for about three years now. And we're just now starting to see the real fruits of our research agenda. And these fruits will allow us to move and give ourselves finality when we need it, to give ourselves sharding through Ouroboros Hydra when we need it, to really understand the needs of the network stack, and then how we actually add side chains into that and maintain the state of many systems concurrently or being able to move value between many systems. To build up to those amazing applications that everybody wants to have, does require really years of effort, solid foundations, good proofs, and a large amount of missteps. And uh, we've gone through a lot of that. So while the protocol development of our space is getting better, uh, it is important to understand it's a long haul and it does take quite a bit of effort. Bitcoin's been around for nine years and we're just starting to see some goodies coming uh, Bitcoin's way. And then it'll eventually get there and it's gonna be a big change for the space. So peer review, good doesn't slow us down. Protocol development's different than software development. Don't confuse the two, but uh, they do need to be done concurrently if you're actually going to build a production system. Okay, uh, one final question. There's been some go back and forth about my credentials, and this is always a fun topic. Uh, so uh, Jackson uh, Palmer, the uh, Dogecoin founder, mentioned it, and people scour my LinkedIn page, which, by the way, is incomplete. So while I did graduate, I did not uh, finish a PhD. And uh, I, when I retire, I probably will go back, although I'll study different things. At the time, I was interested in a field of number theory called additive number theory. And I was really interested in why integers change under addition. So there's all kinds of interesting things like sieve theory and so forth that give you great algorithms to study these things and understand these things, both from an applied and a theoretical standpoint. That type of research has almost nothing to do uh, with the cryptocurrency space or software engineering or protocol development. So I'm woefully unqualified to do those things, which is why we have a very talented chief scientist, Professor Agalos Gassis, and uh, we have people like Phil Wadler and Duncan Kutz and others on the team who do that work because they've devoted near lifetimes, uh, in the case of Wadler, or at least decades in the case of Duncan, uh, towards those ends. Uh, the, the reality about research is you, no matter what your credentials happen to be, you need to have three characteristics to be successful. Uh, one, you have to fail. You have to repeatedly fail. If you're very young and you get successful early on, that's a horrible thing uh, because you start believing you can't fail or that there's something special about you. Uh, the reality is that no matter who you are, where you come from, or how smart you are, you're going to make mistakes. And it's not about whether you can avoid mistakes or not. It's about what you do when you make them. 
and what you learn from them and how you grow from them. Second, you have to be able to work in a team environment. Research is a team sport. There's 10 people working on Ouroboros. They come from different universities, different wakes of life. Some are more mathematically oriented. Some are more workhorses. Some are idea people who don't like writing things down but come up with profoundly amazing ideas. Uh, but you need that team, and you need that team to actually work together. And third, you need to be able to shamelessly borrow from your competitors because they come up with brilliant ideas too, in some cases much better ones than you. So that's credential-free, and you don't really need credentials to, to get there and to do that. Uh, but domain expertise usually is milestoned that way, in particular in the development of cryptographic protocols. It's one of the best ways to get those skill sets. So we do build research teams, and most of those research teams do hold PhDs, uh, but we tend to look at their publications. We tend to look at the things that they've done. I will remind people that Bram Cohen, I don't believe has a PhD, uh, but he won the best paper award at Eurocrypt. We were at the same conference, and we did not win that. Uh, so uh, there really are some amazing people out there, but I'll also remind people Bram's been at this game for a very long time, and he's done some great things throughout his career, including the invention of BitTorrent. So anyway, uh, in the cryptocurrency space, IOHK is pretty neutral with credentials. Uh, we don't really care whether you're a high school dropout or a world-famous professor. Uh, we care about whether you can make mistakes and learn from them. You can work well in a team. And you're also able to learn from your competitors and adopt those ideas that your competitors have into your own uh, idea flow as long as it's reasonable and well-sourced. Uh, so those are some of the questions that, uh, that uh, I've gotten. Uh, there's a few more, but now I'll get to your questions. I just wanted to answer those. So I haven't been paying attention to chat at all. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll take a look at it from the very beginning. Okay, let's see here. All right, Charles, on Reddit, people have been talking about the actual function of ADA token. Can you please elaborate? Okay, so ADA as a token, uh, you know, it serves many different features. So it has the traditional legacy cryptocurrency features that Bitcoin encumbers, which is it's a store of value and you can use it as a means of exchange and uh, it's easy to teleport around the world. So that's a baseload thing. And as you gain more population and more utility around it as a payment system, like for example, if gaming and gambling came in or other such things came in, that in itself would justify a very large capitalization and a large user base. But as a proof of stake system and one that intends on having governance and treasury put in, ADA also represents other dimensions um, as well as being a computation token. So in terms of uh, the other dimensions, uh, proof of stake requires some notion of who should be in charge to make the next block. So uh, there's many ways to hold these elections, but the consensus with most proof of stake architects is this idea of saying your chance of winning is somehow connected to the amount of tokens you have. Uh, Ouroboros is no different. We follow a protocol called follow the Satoshi for the original Ouroboros, and we have some slight variations of that for other versions. But the basic concept is if you have 25% of the supply, 25% of the time, you ought to be elected or have the right to delegate that to uh, someone else to make the next block. And ideally, you would care about making that block because you own money in the system. And if you don't, system's value goes down. So that's the assumption that goes into proof of stake. Whether you like that assumption or not, that's where endogenous consensus comes from. So that's the core of the system in that respect. But then there's also this idea of having a treasury. And in 2019 and 2020, that's an idea we're going to very rigorously pursue. But basically, we're going to connect voting rights to the inflation of the system. So some of the inflation goes to the stakers, but some of the inflation will go into a, a collective account. And like Dash or other currencies, people can submit ballots. It's my belief that uh, systems have to pay for themselves. They have to be economically sustainable. And if you embed a decentralized funding, almost like an NSF or uh, you know, a DARPA into a cryptocurrency, uh, it bodes very well for diversity of thought and diversity of projects. There's a lot of projects, like for example, uh, Raiden or others, which it doesn't make sense to me to have a token or to do an ICO, but they provide tremendous value to the protocol. And it's really a shame when you tell people your only two options are to do something unnecessary for something to function and put a toll into it because that's what you do to get funding or 
to live in a patronage model where you have to go find a rich lord and that lord is going to take care of you and give you some money because then you're subject to the golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. So a treasury system is kind of that nice third option where you say, hey, I and my team have these brilliant ideas that can add value to the ecosystem, whether those be marketing ideas, infrastructure ideas, payment systems, uh, credit card integration, whatever it might be, or it could be technology. And it, you know, we have time and materials, we have costs to do these things. So here's a grant proposal, can the community vote on that? Second, it gets people more engaged in the direction, philosophy, and focus of the platform. When you own Bitcoin, Bitcoin just does its own thing. It's its own protocol. You really aren't as a Bitcoin holder, no matter how much you have, deeply engaged in the governance of the system, unless you choose to be, and you have to put a lot of effort uh, to do that, and it's very controversial. Uh, whereas if you actually have voting rights connected to that, then you'll see these funding proposals come up, and then you have to ask yourself, well, what do I think? Where do I want to go? Where, where should this system go? Is, is this guy who wants to put 1,000 ATMs throughout Africa is that more valuable to the growth adoption of Cardano than the person who wants to create a Coursera class or the person who wants to do core development work or some firm that wants to do an Elixir client or somebody who wants to do all of this uh, software tooling for better smart contracts? So you kind of have to ask yourself, well, with this finite pool of resources, where should we as a community invest those resources to get the best adoption and return? And the great part about having that conversation, whether you win it or lose it, is that you're engaged and it gives the meetup group something to talk about. It gives everybody uh, who's in the ecosystem something to talk about. And because it's going to be a liquid democracy system, you can eventually even have elections and basically have delegates and people come in and say, I really trust Bob He's or I really trust Alice and I like her or I like him. And that person reflects my viewpoints and opinions and that person's going to go and care and get these things done. So if we have any hope of moving from the patronage model or the beneficent dictator model or the, uh, you know, he who has the gold model uh, or the grace and goodwill of people's hearts model and moving into a self-sustaining model, treasury is the way to go. And you need voting rights. Connecting it to the amount of tokens you have is another logical starting point. There are things that can go wrong there. Uh, and plutocracy is not necessarily the best government. So you have to think carefully long-term about how do you ameliorate that? So it's the first step in many. Uh, finally, uh, there's also this idea of computational fuel, uh, which is what Ethereum pioneered. Uh, basically, pay to play. You put some tokens in, there's gas costs to do things, and there's a nice model there, and it provides a great way of creating a price point for certain types of utilities that the network can provide. So outside of it just being a means of exchange and a store of value, these are the other dimensions that you can have. Uh, as a final point, uh, as we move into 2019, we're going to start ratifying our Cardano improvement proposal process, and we're going to put voting systems in for people to vote on different SIPs uh, as we start getting into more controversial things, like how should we do quantum immunity for the system, or should we harden the privacy primitives in the system with the understanding that this is probably going to start reducing liquidity, in particular in jurisdictions where hardened privacy primitives are less than welcome on centralized exchanges. And these are decisions I shouldn't unilaterally make or the Cardano Foundation shouldn't make. These are ultimately decisions that the community should make. Your amount of tokens should be connected to those types of decisions. So ADA represents many different things. And when you build things on top, ADA will represent even more than what I thought it is. But it's a pretty diverse token. Okay. Is Holochain a competition to Cardano? You know, Holochain is kind of like a decentralized DAP framework. And it's got kind of an interesting idea that an avalanche and uh, Hashgraph and these other guys are kind of talking about this concept of I keep local private consensus, my own local state of things. It's almost like Git where you have your version of reality and Bob has his version of reality. And then there's some way that through a hash chain or something, you can reconcile that. So they throw on a DHT and then they have to have an immune system and then there's specific logic for each person's application. And actually, I think Holochain and Avalanche and these other things really focus more on, I'd say, probably the IoT space or uh, the space where you're talking about frameworks of frameworks as opposed to a particular cryptocurrency competitor. I view Cardano more as a financial operating system. It's something where we can go to Ethiopia or to Rwanda uh, and say, hey, insurance and credit and stocks and these things aren't working out so well for you guys. And you know, maybe the government's not the most trustworthy source to get it done. 
So would you like an alternative that you can use without permission? And you can use that to get capital and use that to have trustworthy business between each other. If we solve just that problem, it's a trillion dollar ecosystem. Where things like Holochain and uh, Avalanche and others are saying, well, you need a coordination or management layer for all these applications and devices and there's billions of them eventually, and it's not clear what the economic model is going to look like. You know, when you talk about deploying infrastructure as IBM or Sony, it used to be that that was multi-million dollar infrastructure, and it came with service contracts on a long tail. So you bought the mainframe computers, but also you'd pay for 20 or 30 years to maintain them. But when you talk about sensors, uh, these sensors are very low cost, they're bundled in, but they have ongoing tail costs that are associated with them. And it's not clear who should pay for that, or uh, even though they provide a huge amount of societal value you know, for the farmers knowing what the moisture levels are, the temperature levels are in the field and so forth. So there's a lot of people who are thinking about projects of how do we create a coordination layer on top of this stuff? And then you can hook your things in and then we can find a way to make these devices self-sustaining through some sort of tokenomics. Uh, so there was a great paper written by IBM called ADEPT. Uh, and they were using uh, Telehash BitTorrent in the Ethereum blockchain back in, I think it was 2015, to study IoT. And I'd encourage people to look into that paper. And I see things like Holochain or Avalanche as kind of a natural continuation of that line of thought, but with different ways of handling consensus. At the moment, I think the most evolved and best protocol in that class is Avalanche. Uh, and uh, Team Rocket's really done a great job there. But there's certainly a lot of people that think about that private going public type of consensus, the third model. Okay. Let's see what else we have here. How do you feel about the huge crash in price? Um, you know, as I mentioned before, prices go up, prices go down, and these things are always painful, but you don't look at the day or even the week when you're a fundamentals guy. If you're a day trader, you don't even care about fundamentals. You don't care who's in charge. People day traded Apple stock when Steve Jobs was there, and people day traded Microsoft stock when Bill Gates was in his heyday. At no uh, bearing on the price reality. You look at signals and events and other things, and then you try to predict how will these signals and these events impact the price. When you're a long-term investor and you say, well, what is the long arc going to look like? You then look at the macro and you say, okay, well, what drives adoption? What collections of technologies are necessary for this to be useful? Who's going to use this stuff? And then when you weigh all those fundamentals, your horizons are much longer, three years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and so forth. Uh, so I don't think much about it on a day-to-day -day basis. I, I know how painful it is for people, especially people came in later than others. Uh, but you know, crypto is crazy, and it's been crazy for a really long time. What really bothered me, is that people would copy and copy and copy the same thing, hold ICOs, raise hundreds of millions of dollars off of extremely dubious claims. Prices would go way up because the market was kind of in a me too style. And then uh, the people who ended up getting hurt from that were the poorest people who had the least sophistication. Uh, so when I see things like that, I think we as an industry need to do better. Exchanges need to do better by having more stringent listing standards, uh, community leaders and Crypto leaders need to be a bit harsher for a lot of these Me Too projects. And, uh, you know, we should remind people that there is no free lunch and nothing comes for easy or for free. It's hard. And uh, it takes time and vision and effort for things to grow. So I don't think too much about it, but, you know, it is something we're all forced to contend with. Just because the price goes down doesn't mean people are horrible and people are scammers or bad actors. And, I fully empathize and understand why people get upset and angry. But remember, you haven't lost anything unless you sell. Okay, let's see what else we got here. My dad asked, what do you think about world peace? He does not believe in people in the crypto space consider these issues. You know, I do think about this stuff, and I do think about people in general. And really, society is at a difficult position. 
human race lived in a very hierarchical tribal uh, way. And there was a privileged class for the longest time, the kings, the popes, the presidents, the generals, uh, basically the, the, the top people, and they got to see the board. And everybody else had their little chunk of reality and their paradigm. And they live within that, and society was stable within that state, assuming that globalism doesn't occur, people don't travel too much, people don't mix too much, and people don't ask too many questions. And then somewhere along the way, we had the Enlightenment. People started asking questions, and those control structures that eroded, then there was some foundational questions about the governance structures. So we ripped all the government structures up, and the kings went away. And then we said, well, maybe democracy is interesting. And other people said, well, no, totalitarianism is interesting or communism is interesting. And it leaked its way in. And then we had another vigorous debate in world wars. And then the internet came out. And all of a sudden, we took what the Enlightenment had started and the printing press had started, and we put it on the fastest acceleration in human history. And over an arc of time, we got to a point where no matter where you're born, you could have access to more rich and verified information than a king in a prior time. There's never been a time in human history where that's the case. The problem is that our mental tools, our cognitive tools, and uh, the way we think, the way we act, are products of Darwinism. They're products of evolution. They're products of, of genes which were adapted for survival given a certain type of structure that we've endured for millions of years. Human beings aren't meant to see the whole board and when they do, they have to put in control structures to protect themselves. It's almost like staring at the sun. Uh, so one of the reasons why we're having phenomena like Trump and all this unrest and things are getting volatile and terrorism's around and uh, inequality is exacerbated in certain places it is because we don't have the cognitive tools, the social tools, or the governance structures to deal with the consequences of instantaneous and infinite information. Um, we also don't have collective empathy to live in social structures of hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, when you're in a tribe and you see your neighbors every day, there's a regulation in your behavior. There's a regulation in how you interact with people. But when you're on Twitter and you have 100,000 followers or millions of followers, uh, you know, for example, Elon Musk was the smoking of pot on the Joe Rogan podcast. The guy works 100 hours a week. He's under enormous stress. He has huge social pressures and he has experienced profound success in his life. And he's, he's done amazing things that no one in the world can question. And if you look at the arc of things, he's doing a pretty good job. The problem is that he's run into a situation where his ambition has outpaced his ability to execute. And so when you're under that much stressor as a single human being with the weight of the world on your back, you need to relax. You need to, you need to lay back. So from one angle, you say, oh, finally, this guy is starting to chill a little bit. He's probably mentally going to get to a better state, and that's going to allow Tesla to have a better probability of success. But then people can meaningfully look at the other side of it and say, he's cracking, he's breaking in public. Uh, this guy's falling apart. That and the pedo comment, the funding secure comment. Uh, let's now begin the politics of personal destruction and create a mob to burn him to the ground and get him fired from his job. Why? What is it your business? The vast majority of people criticizing him or having an opinion on him are not in his tribe, have nothing to do with his success one way or the other. And social media has created this reality where we have an empathy gap. Uh, and I think that's one of the greatest threats to this semblance of world peace is a lack of understanding of each other. Well, the, we live in a paradox of never before in human history have we had more information and more access to things than we've ever had before. We are more closed and siloed than we ever had before. We live in a confirmation bias world. For example, if you believe that vaccines cause autism, there is absolutely no scientific reasonable evidence for that. I'm sorry, it's just not true. There is no evidence for this. There may be a million factors that are causing it. We can even meaningfully say perhaps cell phone radiation has something to do with it or overuse of antibiotics destroying people's microbiome. There's more scientific evidence for that, and that's dubious. There was one paper, and the guy who wrote it got burned alive at the academic state because he lied. Yet there are people who wake up every day and believe this, and they only consume material that validates their worldview. And you know, if I look at it from an objective outsider and I have this much versus this much, 
saying something, you'd say, well, there's overwhelming evidence that this thing is true versus this thing. Yet we live in silos, so we only tend to consume things that we want. And uh, there's no greater example of that than the fake news phenomena. If you don't like Obama or you don't like Trump, you tend to consume anti-Obama or anti-Trump news, and you tend to ignore the pro stuff. Now, add these modern tools together, and people get more and more and more entrenched in their ideology. You know, and we never actually start thinking above the problems. Like, for example, for 100 years, governments have been using GDP as a measure of human progress. The very fact that your economy can produce more or certain people have more in no way determines whether that country is a good country to live in. There's plenty of people who live in China who are not doing well, or Saudi Arabia who are not doing well, or for that matter, the United States who are not doing well. Yet, they have high GDPs. So there's other measurements like HDI, for example, that are a bit more egalitarian and they have a, a bit more representative sample of perhaps the quality of life for people. Why aren't we talking about adopting better metrics? Because the old metrics are politically convenient to push. So um, the broader topic of world peace really stems to understanding. Can people understand each other? Do we have tools to communicate with each other? And are we willing to be uncomfortable in our dialogues? Uh, the excoriation of Jordan Peterson is a great example of where we're not prepared for that. People either love him or hate him, but the people who hate him will go to any lengths to validate beliefs that just simply are not true. They'll say he thinks a certain way, says certain things. If you watch interviews, you see some of these people and you say, are we watching the same video? Are we watching the same person talk? Because they'll write an article based on a video they watch and it had absolutely nothing to do with reality, but somehow they're cognitively in a position where this is just the way they perceive reality. Uh, so where does crypto fit into all of this? Well, crypto is intimately connected because crypto is connected to the core roots of society. It's connected into control and into wealth and into governance, and it's connected into how should we relate to each other. There is nothing more meaningful than markets to your lifestyle. If the markets work well, you can eat. If the markets work well, you can better yourself. If the markets work well, you can buy a home and, and not freeze to death. If the markets don't work well, you're going to be worried that your neighbors are going to eat you. That's just the reality. And so the things that can connect to these things and allow us to build better marketplaces are pivotal to building better societies and for us to better understand each other. And crypto touches at the core of that because it talks about how private transactions need to be, how complicated do transactions need to be, who are the gatekeepers, why do we trust them, why do we trust these assets, and so forth. This is why I'm in the space, because I believe this technology, if it's properly applied, is one of the core pillars that we're going to need to use to get the world to be a better place. It's not the only one. We're going to have to somehow figure out how do we as human beings live with a world where everybody's connected, no one ever forgets, and people you've never met can form mobs to destroy you for fun, for no reason, and get you kicked off and you can't make Guardians of the Galaxy 3 or get you fired from your job because of a tweet that you said five years ago or something like that? How do we live in a society where that's seemingly okay or a society that cannot forgive? <laughs> generation ago, it was okay to make mistakes. In this generation, if you're on the wrong side of the political spectrum and you make mistakes, you're gone. So uh, we need better tools for dealing with that. We need better cognitive tools. I'm a big fan of Dan Dennett. Uh, he writes books like Mind Tools and other th such things, and he's done some great YouTube presentations. He's a philosopher over at uh, Tufts, I think. And, uh, you know, I'd hope that people can develop those things. And we also have to be aware of how flawed our thinking processes are and our cognitive biases, our confirmation biases, our inability to deal with statistics. Even if you're a trained mathematician, it's very difficult. So these things combined together, I, I think, can make the world a better place. And also just be relaxed. Okay. Let's see what else we got here. I don't think there's a ceiling in sight. So uh, CT Guitar Guy says, Vitalik said the blockchain space is getting to the point where there's a ceiling in sight. You know, you have this ebb and flow. Uh, I remember when I first entered space, 
there was just Bitcoin and we had a lot of forks of Bitcoin. Things were pretty stagnant. So we had Litecoin and Feathercoin and Namecoin and these things. And so you take the name of the game was you take the GitHub repo, you fork it, you change something, you put some good marketing on it. So Litecoin is the silver to Bitcoin's gold. And then Feathercoin comes out. We're the copper to the silver, right? Uh, and that's where we're at. And then suddenly, you know, this innovation comes out and it says, hey, Ethereum and NXT. Actually, you got to give the NXT guys credit. They were actually the first, in my view, major innovation. And BitShares was pretty innovative too. And so these new wave of things like BitShares and NXT and Ethereum came out. And then it got really interesting there. And then all this new stuff came on the back of that. And now we're entering the third generation. So Vitalik's right. We've probably peaked on the second and we're getting crowded in that side of the space, but the third generation's coming. And it's super exciting because we're starting to see really serious discussions about where does the smart contract fit into the server and the client? How do you do things off chain as good as if they're on chain? Do you really need a blockchain? Like we have an enterprise product coming out where we say we want to have a blockchainless blockchain and we want to do for data what Bitcoin did for money. And, and so, a fundamental assumptions are being challenged. And if, but if you look at the investments, the people that are in the space, the creativity that's in the space, uh, it's overwhelming. And if you look at the actual application, the social problems, it's starting to happen. For example, I was in South Africa. I went to the townships outside of Johannesburg. And I, and I met a great venture called Indlu. It's Zulu for house. And Indlu is doing one of the coolest, most creative things I've ever seen. It's a simple idea, but it's life-changing. So these townships were post-apartheid artifacts, and they would go and build these brick homes, the South African government, years ago, and give uh, people a little bit of land. And uh, they're usually small homes, maybe 500 or 1,000 square feet, sometimes plumbing, sometimes power, sometimes not. But they have a little bit of land there. So what Indlu does is they come in and say, hey, we're going to go build an apartment building on your land six to eight tenant apartment building. It only cost about $30,000 to build, but it follows really good construction standards. And I'll even post some pictures on Twitter. Uh, they're really cool buildings. Uh, and anyway, uh, they have like an Airbnb style app. And people can rent it out for as little as $80 a month up to about $250 a month. So very low rent for uh, these people. And what they do is they give 10% of all of that to the homeowner for five years. And then after five years, they let the homeowner keep it becomes their property. They own it completely outright and they can never go cash flow negative. Now they've already built 10 of these things and they're just gangbusters popular and they're going to build hundreds more. So they came to us and they said, hey, we, we want to do a blockchain project. And I was very cynical. I said, oh, let me guess. You want to do an ICO and this? And they said, no, 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 no. Don't even want a token. We're not even thinking about that. Maybe later on we can have that discussion to do a co-op and have the homeowners actually own the company. But what we care about is land registry. Because when you go to these townships, when they sell their property, they don't tell the government. They just shake hands, hand a piece of paper, said, here you go, now you own it. So if you're actually trying to reconstruct history, sometimes you have to go 10 years ago and through oral tradition, say who bought what from where, and you have to rebuild the whole registry. The government doesn't know what's going on, doesn't care. So they said, could we build a blockchain-based registration system? Credentials. Some of these townships have over 30% unemployment, 30%. And all the time when you're building something, people come up to you and they say, hey, I'm a plumber or I'm a mason or I'm an electrician or I'm just a laborer. I'd like to do some work for you. And you say, prove it. And they say, well, I don't really have a credentials. I don't have a degree. I don't have any certificate, but I've done it for 10 years. So they said, could we build an identity management system and build a credentialing system? So when people work on these projects, we can have a reputation system and know which local masons are good and which local plumbers are good and so forth. That's the magic of blockchain technology, is it solves problems like that. So when Vitalik says something like, oh, well, the space is super crowded and you know we're at a ceiling and we can't grow anymore, it's like, we have yet to solve that one venture's problem, which is the same problem that billions of people throughout the world have. So maybe we've peaked in terms of a trillion dollar market cap for the moment and uh, you know ICOs aren't gonna raise $4 billion anymore, but we sure as hell haven't solved and lose problems and by extension, the problems of billions of people throughout the world, despite the fact that technology that we're building in this space can solve their problems. But then you say, but Charles, well, but that doesn't have a token. So what does that mean to ADA or what does that mean to Ether? These other things. Well, guys, the minute that we get them into a digital system, those assets can now be moved into public ledgers and back. Once you have a credential identity system, you have everybody in the township registered, 
those people for the first time ever can get insurance and loans, and they're not going to get it from AIG. They're not going to get it from J.P. Morgan Chase. It's going to be a peer-to-peer -peer lending system, probably on a public network, and they have a digital identity that is compatible with our system. So to get to the next generation, we have to solve that. We have to find ways to connect to these real-life problems, these real-life ventures, and you know, actually connect these guys to our systems, and then once we've done that, they'll do the rest because they don't have to ask for permission. They're hungry, they wanna work hard, and they're ready to go. It's our job to wire them up though and get them into the system and to find ways to solve real life problems. So um, I don't think Silicon Valley like, I don't spend much time there. I, I think the bubble there is quite counterproductive to good things. I go to the townships and I go to Rwanda and I go to Ethiopia and deal with the coffee farmer because we can find a way collectively to get millions into these systems we will see trillions of dollars of wealth created as a result of new people participating in the economy. And the vast majority of that wealth will not touch banks. It will not touch the legacy system. It'll touch the crypto system. So that's the next generation. Um, also in terms of the science, the protocols are just getting so much better. Uh, there's a lot of great ideas that were seeded in the 2013s and 2014s, which are just now starting to reach the light of day. So. I, I frankly disagree with the assertion that our best days are behind us. I think our best days are ahead of us, and uh, I see how hungry people are. Okay. Is the 3D modeling in the IOH case set a precursor to your work in VR? You know, I get questioned a lot about what is the point of design at IOHK? You know, we're almost like a three-legged stool. You know, two legs everybody gets. They're the engineering leg and the science leg. But then we have this third leg, design. And people say, well, why the hell do you have that? Why, why do you pay all these designers? Why do you have guys who understand 3JS and WebGL and these things? What, why do you care about VR and AR? The reality is that everything we do on the paper side and on the code side is boring and dead. You know, if I print something out, it's a dead tree. If I write some code, it's spent electricity. And 99.9% .9 of people don't care about it, can't relate to it, can't understand it, and it means nothing to them. If you took the world's best video game and you just gave somebody a paper printout of all the source code of it, how do you think that average person would relate to it? They would say, this is, this is, what is this? This is just paper with stuff on it. You compile the code, you run the code, they can see it, they can interact with it. They have a great experience. They say, wow, this is incredible. So to us, very early in our company's history, we felt it was very important for us to give a certain group of people within IOHK a mandate to imagine and dream and build experiences, even knowing that this is going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort, and we're going to have to get really creative. Second, I wanted to have common projects that unified my entire company. You know, if you look at our front page, we actually have something coming out on Monday. I think you guys are going to like a lot. But if you look at our front page, you know, we, we have these graphics, these animations, like Symphony of Blockchains and the Complexity is Beautiful and the Decentralization Graphic and more to come. But those are built collaboratively throughout the whole company. It unifies the project manager, the QA people, the release people, the marketing people, the comms people, the scientists, the engineers, myself. There is nothing that everybody works on except for those types of things, because everybody can have an opinion about an aesthetic, about a font, about a color, about a lighting effect, and so forth. Uh, so if anything, just to get people to talk to each other within the company, it's tremendously valuable to build up a great culture. But more importantly, it makes what we think about and do much more accessible to the mainstream public. For example, uh, when we came up with the idea of symphony of blockchains, we asked a very foundational question. What should a blockchain sound like? I have no idea, you know, and it's a fun question to ask. You think, well, hang on a second here. It's code. It's, it's a data structure. It doesn't have a sound. I say, yes, and planets shouldn't have a sound, but NASA can target something towards one of them, and you can get some audio from it. So it does have a sound. Go figure. So there should be a sound for a blockchain, and if there isn't one, let's invent a world where there is a sound for a blockchain. Then everybody can have an opinion about that. And then you start asking questions like, well, what should we concern ourselves with? Maybe transaction throughput, or maybe mining should be louder than proof of stake because work is being expended. What's the mempool do to it? 
you know, uh, does the signature scheme we use have any impact on this? And in the process of asking those questions, people start understanding blockchains in a very different dimension. They look at them in a very different way. They start saying, wow, these things are a lot more elegant and complicated than we thought. And there's a lot of nuances here. And they start caring about the nuances because there's an end goal there. There's this end goal of saying, can we create a symphony from these sounds? Now, that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort. And then when you have the sound, then you start asking, well, can we bring it into different spaces? It's right now on the computer. It's right now on the desktop. But could we create a reality where we can put this into VR or AR? And then we can go take it on tour and go to the Guggenheim or some gallery. And then suddenly a group of people, 50, 60 years old, who look at Picassos and Van Goghs every day, who don't give a shit about our space, are now looking at our space as if it's the most amazing thing they've ever seen. That brings new people in. And it gives people better ideas. And they start asking questions about, well, why are you doing that? And then sometimes you say, I don't know. And in the process of saying that, you learn something. And then you go back to the drawing board and say, God, there's something we never thought about. So I learned studying mathematics that it is exceptionally important to create conditions where you have different ways of looking at the same model or the same problem. You could look at an object and say, I want to prove it has certain properties. Or you could create an anti-object and smash it together with that object. And you know, that anti-object should have the opposite of all those properties. And if the two things collide, it should create a plane, which they should balance out, like matter and antimatter. Now, you could either go to the front door and boringly prove all these properties, or you could imagine what such an anti-object looks like and how to combine these two things together. They both solve the same problem. One is more elegant than the other. So... In the same way, design is built into the DNA of IOHK, and we do care very deeply about these things. We're not moving as fast as I would personally like because it takes an enormous amount of time to find designers and train designers about how blockchains work and cryptocurrencies work and to get people actually rolling. But you'll see little by little, we've actually massively improved a lot of our animation quality, and now we're actually starting to get into VR and AR, and I think we're going to have a huge sea change exiting this year and going into 2019. And that's the part of the company I have the most fun with. And it's the part of the company I love the most uh, because it's just an endless well and it's something we can really enjoy. I'd also hope that many people copy that and it inspires consensus and all these other guys to say, hey, we have some surplus money and we have all these brilliant people. Why not instead of giving it to try to get some guy in Dubai to like us or to do another pilot, we go and do some design stuff. And if they start doing that by ripple effect, many people in the space will actually take these things more seriously. And that's what's going to get us from being cool things that nerds care about, the printed source code on paper, to that beautiful video game that millions of people can play. And it's going to bring a lot more people into the space. OK. Will there be a coin burn for ADA? <laughs> okay. I, I, I always answer this question uh, because it's just such a great question. Uh, whose coins are you going to burn? And once you answer that for me, then, uh, then I'll, uh, I'll take the question seriously. But I, I get it all the time. <laughs> That's great. Oh, man. When mobile wallet? Uh, actually, that's a great question, too. So, uh, you know, we chose Haskell, and Haskell has just been a mixed bag. It's been great, and it's been a nightmare at the same time. And uh, at some point, I threw in the towel. I said, okay, let's diversify development a little bit. So we created a Rust project called Prometheus, and uh, we ended up creating the Cardano Rust wallet. And the code is up on GitHub. And the first product of that was Icarus, which gave us a Chrome extension. And uh, now that's being built up uh, by Emergo for Uroi. Now, the reality of this Rust code base is that it has all the batteries included for a mobile client. So if you wanted to take it and use it as the heart of a mobile client, you can. And in discussions with Nico, the CTO of Emergo, 
they're going to do just that thing, but there's probably going to be competition because it's uh, it's like 50, 60% there. You just need to put a front end and figure out how you're going to do some things with that. So mobile wallets are really going to come, and they're going to come faster than you'd think. And hardware wallets are going to come as a result of this. In fact, um, I just found out surprisingly that uh, Trezor apparently uh, is just waiting on a firmware update, and we should actually have support with them, and we're one firmware update for Ledger. So in short order, the next three to six months, we should see mobile experiences, hardware experiences coming out of the uh, Rust Cardano effort. Now, Haskell's still our core, and we're still doing a lot of work there, and we've learned a lot as a company for it, but sure is difficult ecosystem to write code in, especially when you talk about interoperability. You know, Rust is just so damn portable. It works on everything, and it's really easy to get it to work with WebAssembly or on mobile devices, and Haskell is, is just like that screaming kid you know, in the store that throws a temper tantrum and you have to drag them out by their foot uh, to get somewhere. Um, you know, it's uh, it's a really difficult language to work with at times and uh, it's very temperamental. Uh, we've certainly learned a lot in the process and we'll get better at working with it. And it has huge upsides when it's working well, but when it's not working well, it slows you down a little bit. So a uh, mistake we made early on was not diversifying some of the development processes, but we've ameliorated that with the Rust Cardano side of things. And we're scaling that team up and that team is seeing great acceleration. And uh, there's already some really cool things you can do with it. In fact, some videos are coming out for the one year anniversary of Cardano to show you all the cool things that you can do. And that team is uh, one of our crown jewels. How can you make sure exchanges are excluded from staking? Is it possible technically? So technically, no, but it can be enforced by you, the user. So uh, early on when we said, hey, hang on a second here, uh, our security assumption is if you own it, you care about it. There's a class of users who own it but don't care about it, and those are exchanges and cloud wallets. So if you take your ADA or your Ether or your EOS or whatever the hell your token happens to be, and you give that token to a third party, and that token carries within it, at that address, certain rights. What you have done is you've transferred the token rights to that third party. Even if they're a custodian, meaning that you still have legal ownership of the asset and can recall it, the protocol has no native way of differentiating between you and that other user. Now, you can dream up all kinds of things like, well, maybe we can put these in a smart contract, or maybe we can have like two keys and... You know, you retain the staking rights, but then they have it or something. But the easiest way of solving it, and, you know, there's Occam's razor. Simplicity is, is usually the best way of doing things. The best answer uh, is just to create separate addresses. So you have one address structure for everyday accounts. That's what Daedalus will generate. And when you send it from A to B, you have that. And then you have another address structure called an exchange address, and you make them cosmetically different so people can visually see the differences between them. And that address is omitted from stake rights. So what happens is if you have 100 ADA in the system, that's all the ADA you have, you know, if you have 10 ADA, you'd normally say, okay, I have 10% chance of being elected to do something. Well, if you send that over to an exchange address, let's say that 10 ADA, now there's just 90 in circulation. So uh, that 10 ADA is, is as if it doesn't exist until it comes back to a regular address. Because the blockchain, you can track these types of things. And you as a user know when you're sending stuff to an exchange address. So what we can do is go to exchanges and say, here's the APIs for this. Here's how you generate them. And here's how you do account management with them. And then the users can self-regulate and say, hang on a second here. Why am I not sending funds to an exchange address? If I'm not doing that, that means the exchange can mint with my money. That's not good. Do I get money for that? Or they can offer their users an option like, we'll delegate to the pool of your choice and give you some of the profits from that or something like that. So that's step one. Step two is creating a carrot for exchange addresses to be used. And so we've batted around a lot of ideas, like, for example, transaction reversals within a window of time. So you can create two keys as an exchange address. You can have a spending key and a recall key. And what you can do is you say, if you sign with both, you have instant settlement. So as if you spent from a normal address. But if you instead just spend with one, the spending key, you can build into the system the ability to reverse that transaction within a window of time, say K, maybe 12 hours or something like that. Now, why would you want to do that? Because if you're an exchange, the vast majority of the hacks that occur, you detect within the first 12 to 24 hours. 
So if you have a reversal, you can reverse it quickly. From the user experience, it means they have slower settlement. So when you pull your money out of the exchange, it doesn't clear until 12 hours, but it gives the exchange time to recover. It also allows you to have a more efficient cold hot wallet storage where you can have everything be in a hot wallet, and then you have the recall keys in cold storage, and then you have anomaly detection systems that run, and if you see something, you can pull those things out of cold storage and reverse the transaction. But if the user wants instant settlement, they pay a slightly higher fee and you sign with both keys. You could do something like that with exchange addresses or even have discussions about things like proof of solvency and so forth. And uh, I think that as we get deeper down that rabbit hole of these types of addresses, uh, we're going to go more and more into those types of requirements in collaboration with exchanges and gathering their wish lists of requirements, which will increase adoption of that address type, which will create more incentive for people to behave appropriately and for those incentive schemes to be what they need to be. So everybody has to have an opinion who's on the proof of stake side, whether they actually do address segregation or bonding or some other uh, way of doing that. But you have to have that because, or otherwise you're just gonna have a situation where 20, 30, 40% of your money in circulation is held by people who don't actually own it. And therefore you can't make game theoretic assumptions about behavior. So human readable addresses are another interesting thing. So it's very easy to do human readable addresses um, in that you can create a namespace where people can take an account, let's say a family of public keys generated from an HD wallet, and they can say for that family, sequential indexed HD wallet, I'm going to have a lookup table and say that's Charles's address and I could register such a thing. And you could have a first come first serve, but you still have to have some form of a root of trust behind that. So one thing we've toyed with is this idea of friends with wallets. So if you look at the social graph and you say, okay, Bob and Alice know each other. And so what Bob and Alice can do is become friends and Alice can sign Bob's address and then Bob can sign Alice's address, almost like web of trust with PGP. And then once you have that, you can just drop down and say, pay to Bob. And you have a nice look up there. And that can either be blockchain based or it can be out of band. And the wallet can manage that or you can manage it from the blockchain. And it's part of that metadata story behind addresses. So that's the most obvious way of doing it. And as we move towards uh, considering things like privacy and KYC and AML, uh, especially when we start talking about security tokens and these types of things where such assumptions are made or non-fungible assets like the ERC721 standard, it's something we're gonna think a lot about. Um, there is another way to do human readable addresses where you can say, well, we can represent addresses as keywords, kind of like the BIP39 standard. The problem is that if you do the math, you have to have a lot of words to replicate the same level of entropy as a normal address. So you have these huge multi-word addresses, like 30, 40, 50 words or something like that. I forget the calculation. We did it a while ago. Uh, so that's a less fruitful avenue. I wish math just worked that way. We're, I could give you 10 keywords and that's my public key. And then you can remember words instead of numbers. And it's cognitively easier for people to do that. So uh, some sort of account-based friend system with a way of registering a family of addresses, a sequential index HD wallet is probably the best way in my view of doing a human readable address. Certainly making addresses shorter. And as we move from random to sequential index HD wallets with Icarus, and we'll backport that into Daedalus, uh, that's definitely a, uh, a priority for us. But moving beyond that, it's important to be able to say, okay, I want to send money to Charles, I want to send money to Bitstamp, I want to send money to Coinbase, and to have some sort of way of verifying, well, that is actually Coinbase, that is actually Charles, either because I called him and we did that together, or we have some sort of root of trust that uh, we can overlay into the protocol to do that, or a reputation system to give us some sort of certainty. And there's plenty of projects that run around that think about these things, like Uport and others. Uh, so um, it's, a, it's a fun thing to do, and we're certainly going to get there soon. Can you explain the difference between Plutus Marlowe and Yella and the KEVM? Sure. So you can break smart contracts and financial transactions into kind of two worlds. There is the world of I am sending some notion of value between one actor or a group of actors to another actor or to another group of actors. So there is a representation of that value. There's the terms and conditions behind it. There are the events to trigger it. It's called contingent settlement. There's a story about that. And that's a financial contract. Okay. 
and you can have data feeds that go into it. It can be completely deterministic. It can be non-deterministic. There's all these things. You can have complex event processing going on. It's a, it's a big story. So when you think about that, it's really a story about correctness. It's really a story about is the intent actually reflected in code? It's a story about efficiency of that transaction, settlement time of that transaction, and so forth. That has really nothing to do with this idea of throwing away Amazon or Rackspace or this common notion that we have with dApps. So what we decided to do early on was say, let's differentiate between when I want better finance and when I want to do something a little crazy like this whole idea of the dApp. And when you do that differentiation, you gain huge efficiencies because you can get much better security, much better certainty, much better guarantees of termination and correctness of behavior when you're dealing with domain-specific languages and more limited capabilities. It's one of the reasons why Satoshi limited Bitcoin script. So Marlowe, and to a certain extent Plutus, is about that notion. That's saying, I want to have very rich financial relationships and transactions between Alice and Bob, or Microsoft and Google, or Goldman Sachs and Chase. I want to have an ability of writing down intent, verifying the intent has been followed, and getting fast settlement and knowing exactly when these things are going to happen and how they're going to happen and represent assets with arbitrary complexity and different notions of custodianship behind those assets. Then there's a different world, which is I want to write programs. And there's a triangle for those programs. There's the client. That's what runs on your computer. The server, that's what runs on someone's server or servers, multiple servers, the cloud. And then there's the smart contract, the DAP. It's the triangle. And so what we haven't figured out in the cryptocurrency space is what that triangle needs to look like for us to actually have an innovation. So for example, if you have CryptoKitties, should 100% of that run on Ethereum? Or is it okay for a large chunk of that to run uh, on a server? And maybe we use Ethereum as a verifier and an auditor to make sure that there's a consistent state amongst the users, but the actual game itself is conducted out of band. And there's some notion of eventual settlement, eventual consistency. Okay, so what Yella and KVM are about is about following that model of saying, I need some sort of replicated engine that I can deploy code to, and the code is going to run, and it's going to run in a security model where the output that I get, I have a high degree of certainty to. It's got storage, got network capacity, got some computation. It's, it's very expensive to utilize, and it's not meant to replicate the entire application, just a service whether that be random number generation or that be uh, auditing that some computation's been done correctly, so checking a proof of correctness, there's a big story behind that. And then you take that into that broader triangle, and then you say, okay, what needs to run on a server and what needs to run on my client computer? So that's the DAP model. Now, why yellow? Well, because K and semantic space computa uh, compilation gives us a path over an arc of time to have the best possible tooling to verify these types of programs are written correctly, and also gives us the greatest chance to have interoperability with the largest set of languages. Java, C++, C, JavaScript, Python, Ruby, Clojure. There are so many programming languages. And when you have this large spectrum of many, many languages, you know it's really unfortunate that you have to make hard decisions like, well, do I write the compiler for this language or that language? Well, if you have a way of just saying write the semantics in K, you can let those user communities self-support. They just write the semantics once for their language. They register the language on chain, and now everybody has access to it. So if you want Python, you go to the Python community and say, go do this. It takes a few weeks, and then it's here. And you get the advantage of having all this great new tooling. So it's useful for Python itself, not just for cryptocurrencies. So there's a carrot there. And then we all get to use that. And if we ever update the virtual machine to yellow version 2 or version 3, you don't have to update the compilers because the semantics auto-update uh, with your semantic space comp uh, compilation. So that's the difference between the two. One is really all about, I want to write better financial transactions and better assets and these types of things. There's a whole family of thought, and that's what Marlowe is all about, and to a certain extent, Plutus. And then the other side of it is all about, I want to have a that service in that triangle to do something for my application, which is going to run on your computer, on a server, or maybe even serverless, and it's going to run on a blockchain. 
And I want to have a rich environment where I can run that, where we can have a meaningful conversation about maximizing the amount of tools and languages that I can use for that. So that's the initial difference between the two. The secondary difference between the two is that they actually are going to run on different ledgers. You see, the advantage of having a two-layer model is not that you have two ledgers. You have unlimited ledgers once you have a two-layer model because you have a base ledger to act as the conductor, but you can always add another chair for the symphony. You can always add another violinist. You can always go ahead and add another uh, cello if you really want to. So uh, along that same token, it's trivial for me to have KEVM and Yellow running in the same system and then maybe EOS or maybe something else. So if there's a particular competitor who's done some great work and they're getting a lot of adoption, I can bring that into my system. And because we have better base protocols, we can make an argument that it's faster, cheaper, and safer to be in our system than our competitor system. And then we get ease of interoperability there. It's easy for them to move over. If anything, just to have a layer of compatibility for a system because they can talk to each other potentially. So that's why we chose that model. That's why we chose that differentiation. The heart of the system is about accounting and complex financial transactions, the financial operating system. But then we also have to permit rich computation because that triangle requires it. Now, on the client side, we have Daedalus, and that's all about having a decentralized app store. So you can have one-click installation for all your apps, and that's a whole can of worms and a fun can of worms to get into. And then trying to figure out how do we get that server into our system and how do we reduce the load of trust on that server. That's called outsourceable computation or verified computation. And in some cases, we have collective computation problems. That's called multi-party computation. So the other side of Cardano is about thinking more holistically about where, how, when, and who are going to run my applications and what am I giving up for what I'm gaining and have a much more nuanced scenario than the replicated computational environment that Ethereum has, which is you add more miners, you get more certainty the calculation was right, but you don't get any performance improvement. It's like having more and more people in the room working on the same math problem. It doesn't make you solve the problem any faster. You just get more certainty that the problem is, is correct, especially if you have a desired time to finish it, like 20 seconds or something like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. Do giraffes get a neck ache? <laughs> you know, it's funny. I was in South Africa and we went on safari. And um, I had this lovely female giraffe that uh, actually followed our safari car all around. And the uh, safari guy, he... Uh, his name was Alex. He said, oh, you know, giraffes love potato chips. I said, are you sure it's a really good idea to feed them? It's like, no, they absolutely love potato chips. And it turns out that giraffes really, really like potato chips, so much so that they're willing to bend their head down and get into the car with it. So I suspect they probably got a neck ache from that. Um, but uh, great experience. Love giraffes. Okay. Are you going to introduce ring signatures into Cardano so that they can be used the dark net to buy things that aren't illegal? Um, you know, I, I mentioned this earlier about privacy primitives in the system. So uh, we think a great degree about privacy. It's actually one of the sexiest research topics for graduate students and one of the sexiest things for cryptographers to publish things about. Uh, you get great media. You, you, you can go to all the right clubs and parties. You get to go to DEF CON and say, hey, look, I have something really cool three-letter agencies sometimes start reaching out to you and say, hey, would you like to do a presentation? Uh, so uh, cryptographers have a certain appreciation and love for anonymity and for privacy primitives. And in the cryptocurrency space, that's like taking that traditional hallowed place and putting it up on steroids and making it really cool. So ring signatures are an older primitive and they're used in Monero and other things. Um, and we could certainly add such a thing to Cardano. 
Where it gets really interesting is when you start thinking about holistic privacy systems. So it's not just good enough to think about privacy in terms of linkability. That's what we typically think about as kind of like level one when you're starting to build out a privacy system. So linkability is saying, I have an address, address A, can I determine who owns address A? Is that Charles? Is that Bob? And what level of certainty do I have? And what you know facts and circumstances go into that? Then the next level is saying, well, maybe I can't necessarily link things, but I can know who's using the network. And if only like 35 people are using the network, I might not be able theoretically to link it, but you know, I can do some other out of band things to winnow that set down to the one person who's using it because there's only one guy in my country who's using it. Okay. So there's network level anonymity as well. Can you obfuscate the fact that you're using the protocol and uh, to what level can you do that? And we've seen things like Dandelion and uh, desires to run protocols over Tor and things like that to, to try to get down that road. Then there's amount anonymity. So you know, if I'm sending a transaction between Alice and Bob, A and B, can we obfuscate how much was sent, like a confidential transaction? Now, why would you want to do that? Because again, it creates a target surface. You know, if you're an observer, you might not necessarily be able to link Alice to A and Bob to B, but you can watch for large transactions and say, boy, a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin just moved. That's probably something interesting. Let's go look into that. And let's do a bunch of forensic analysis around the metadata there to try to understand that. So when you think about privacy, to me, it's useless unless you start thinking clearly about, well, how do you build an ecosystem of privacy around your system? And then there's the environments that these things run in, your computer. Your computer is notoriously Swiss cheesed. Uh, if you're running Windows, there are back doors into it. A, the underlying hardware, there's a lot of very credible people who believe there are hardware back doors in that. So you, know, you have to ask yourself, who are you trying to anonymize yourself from? From the script kitty or the professional hacker? It's probably possible to do that with good cryptographic primitives and good conduct. From the state actor, it's probably impossible to do that because it's a rigged game. They have advantages that normal people don't have. One of my favorite papers I have, uh, I've ever read uh, was written where people were able to use a microphone listening to changes in the frequency of a CPU to steal a private key for a PGP key. So they could sit at a coffee shop with a microphone listening to a computer that was encrypting and decrypting files using a, you know, keys. And it just by listening to the subtle changes in frequency, it could actually steal the key. It gives you a sense of the level of sophistication and the level of creativity that people have come up with uh, in terms of InfoSec. And it's just a, always a war. And it's always a, uh, the adversary is always very powerful and they don't play a fair game. So when you think about privacy in that context, it's also about, well, who do you care about? If your goal is to hide from the government, uh, you're going to have a very difficult life. If your goal is to protect yourself um, and to anonymize a lot of your activities, you probably can accomplish that with some best practices and so forth. Um, you know, another thing is access control. So, you know, if you have history you're probably going to want to know your history because you can't remember everything, especially as your financial life gets more and more complicated and more interdependent on a lot of things. So you have to store that somewhere. And so even if you have a perfect protocol that provides perfect privacy and everything's great and you have very secure environments to run these things in, there is a back door, which is you. You are the back door. So as a consequence, um, how do you get access but no one else does? How do you remember and so forth? You know, one of the things that changed my life is when I moved to LastPass. I tried very diligently to remember hundreds of different passwords and all these creative schemes. And I said, you know, at the end of the day, I'm just going to go with LastPass and do two-factor authentication and this and that. And yes, I'm trusting certain things, but it's pretty good service. And I think it's dramatically improved my personal security and I have a lot more control over it and it's made my life a lot better. But I accept that I am giving up a little bit of privacy there and I also am giving up a little bit of control there for that trade-off that I've made. So... Privacy lives within that context of the backdoor you yourself have, the environments that the systems run in, the type of adversary that you're dealing with, and exactly what are you talking about with the privacy? Is it linkability? Is it the network? Or is it the amounts? Now, getting to Cardano in particular, 
this is a very controversial topic because the more private you make a system, you have 70-year-old lawmakers who love questioning Mark Zuckerberg and they're fun to watch uh, at Senate hearings and things like that who don't know their head from their ass for any of these things. And somebody comes along like the FBI or the NSA and tries to convince them that you should have secret backdoors in crypto because that's the way the world needs to work. And unfortunately, every now and then those people end up passing laws or they end up passing regulations or they end up using soft influence to convince exchanges to delist or banks to blacklist and so forth. So there needs to be a community discussion within Cardano. And I think that's the first great use case of a governance system is to have a discussion of how private should we be? My scientists are geniuses. They have long, great careers. They study things like zero-knowledge cryptography, and they sure as hell get privacy. And they've done things for the European Union and all these other guys. They've worked for the military. They've worked for uh, three-letter agencies every now and then. There's a, a huge diversity in my organization with people who have great track records to think about that whole pie and to build great privacy experiences. But at the end of the day, we do not have the right to make such a foundational decision for the Cardano ecosystem. Because that decision will have an impact on liquidity and price. If we go too private, we probably will get delisted from a lot of exchanges, especially in Asian countries. If we go in the other direction, we probably will be more palatable to governments and the price may go up. But you have a Facebook style scenario where there's a back door in the system. So it's a spectrum. And what we can do as engineers and scientists is we can tell you the trade-offs and what the tech looks like, how it's going to slow down the system, what it's going to do to your latency, to the transaction sizes, and the societal trade-offs and say, if we go down this road, these are the consequences. And the first great governance challenge I think is going to come is going to be about privacy. It's sure as hell not going to be about scalability because at the end of the day, you know, our research gives us good trade-off profiles. So when we come in, we say, would you guys rather have X thousand transactions per second or X dozens of transactions per second? You said more is better. Let's do that, especially if the trade-off profile is very reasonable. But on privacy, there's no clear solution. We could go with bulletproof stuff. We could go with ring signatures. We could put dandelion into the base protocol. And by doing that, massively enhance your privacy. We could build special uh, devices where you have plausible deniability, just like uh, uh, TrueCrypt or these other guys, where you, you know you can you can have alternative ways to decrypt things, and so you could appear as if you don't even have the thing installed on your computer. You can boot off a USB device into memory only and interface with your wallet this way. There's a thousand ways we could approach this problem, a thousand ways. But, and this is the big thing, each and every one of those ways has an unclear scenario. Here's the last point about privacy. Imagine that you lived in Iraq in 1970, 1975, something like that. And the person comes up to you and says, are you a member of the Ba'ath Party? You would say, if you were, yes. Why? Because that was how you got ahead during that time period. You know, there was a one-stop show. They had a monopoly on power. If you're in the party, you get to go to the good school. You get the good job. You get all the opportunities. If you're outside of the good graces of the party, your life pretty difficult. Fast forward to post-occupation Iraq after Iraqi freedom and Bremer and Wolfowitz debath the country, and they say, "Are you a member of the Ba'ath Party?" You say, "No, God, I don't know anything about them." And, oh no, no, I was one of the opposition guys. Why? Because you potentially could be ineligible for going to the right schools or serving in government, or you have a very soft bias against you. So the very same fact, a piece of information, has a historical arc to it based on the facts and circumstances that you cannot predict. In that, in the beginning, you would say yes and broadcast it everywhere. The more you do it, the higher in the food chain you get. And then later on, it's a liability for you. Same piece of information. And the problem with secrets is once you tell them, everybody knows it. So it's very difficult to know how private things ought to be and who should have access and when should you tell people and so forth. And so it opens up a broader conversation about minimum viable escalation of privacy. There is no greater example of that in the financial world than KYC and AML. For example, 
uh, right now we have a very bad situation if you run a bank or an exchange somebody comes to you and says hi bitstamp or hi bitrix or hi shapeshift i want to do business with you and they say great show me your passport or proof of funds or uh, proof of residency give me a utility bill they have to collect that and it's information that's a liability for them because they hold it they can't do much with it and then if they get hacked they lose it and they get sued or they go out of business from it or causes a lot of commercial harm and mistrust and then the government comes and says you have to weaponize that data against your own customers so you have to put in anomaly detection systems and if somebody's doing something that's unusual you have to file a suspicious activity report so you take a normal commercial relationship and now an entity through regulatory fiat, because regulators don't have unlimited power or resources, they delegate it to the financial businesses, are now in a position where they have to spy on their own customer and hold something they have great liability for. Wouldn't it be a better world if you owned your own data and you could take that and put it into a warehouse that you control and only you can see, then you can invite on a case-by-case -case basis auditors to come in and attest to the data. Yes, I'm an American citizen. Yes, I'm this age. Yes, I paid my taxes. They can sign that. And then when you want to go do business with Bitstamp, you send the transaction to them. It goes to pending, and they play a game of 21 questions, and they just ask whatever the government tells them to ask. This transaction coming in, where is it origin? U.S.? Okay. Pull up the U.S. library. For the U.S. library, how much... Uh, uh, how many questions we have to ask? Uh, what's the age of the person? Where's the location of the person? And do they pay taxes? The IRS sign off on that. And once you get enough yeses, the transaction settles. And that's that. There is no suspicious activity report. There's none of these things. There's no data custodianship. That's a world we could live in within 10 to 15 years, especially if we start building parallel systems like with the Pan-African strategy where they're just now entering the KYC world and they don't have to adopt the legacy system. And that's a world that could kill the compliance officer in 25 years and save banks a huge amount of money and return them to service-based businesses instead of adversarial businesses that are soft regulators over your conduct and behavior. That's intimate to the privacy question because we could actually build in nuances to that system. For example, while you could own your data and that's anonymized, we could build a backdoor in where if a sufficient amount of thresholds are met, and a sufficient amount of actors agree, we could de-anonymize the data to a particular actor, like a judge or a regulatory body. The cryptographic primitives to do this type of thing do exist, and uh, they're becoming more nuanced. So maybe instead of saying absolutely private, total libertarian, absolutely not private, we're in China, you could actually have a spectrum there, and people could decide what that spectrum needs to look like, and reasonable people can disagree. So I think the privacy question of should Cardano be X or Y is much more nuanced. It needs to be a community discussion, and it has to fit into the environments that Cardano is going to operate in. One of our big goals is to merge the permissioned and permissionless worlds together and have Cardano run in a pan-African way. We think that we can get hundreds of millions of users off that continent over a long arc of time. And if we're doing that, it has to be a system that replicates the functionality and expectations of the legacy financial world. So it's not good enough just to be able to write the transactions. We have to have a meaningful articulation about compliance, about regulation, and about privacy. And if you, you get the right base protocols in, you can build a reality where you have competition, you have a diversity of thought, and over time you converge to something good. The one thing we won't do at IOHK is we won't be like Ripple. We won't put Ben Lasky on our board. We won't kowtow to whatever makes us the most money or gives us the best access. Because at the end of the day, if I wanted to work in the legacy financial world, I'd have just taken a job at a bank. The whole reason we build open protocols and open systems and we oppose things like BitLicense is because that's the 20th century. That's a hierarchical world. That's a bad world. And that's the world that causes 2008. And that's the world that turns banks into spies on their own customers. It's immoral, it's wrong, it's unsustainable, and it will collapse at some point. We have a point in human history where we can either decide to double down on the past and become a very dystopian world where everybody gets a number on their forehead, and if it gets too low, you get kicked out of society, and if it gets high, you get the good life, to a world where you're in control of your data, you're in control of your money, and you're in control of the way you interact with markets. It doesn't mean you get to do whatever the hell you want to do because when you do business with somebody, they have a say on how you do business with them. But it does mean at the end of the day, at least you get a choice accepting the consequences of that choice. So privacy fits as a component of that. 
And it's something we do care a lot about at our company. Mm-hmm. That's a good question. Can anything be done about people who get coins scammed from them and uh, have that transaction reversed? You know, we have this thing. And we've had it for a very long time. It's, it's right here. It's called cash. It's a $5 bill. Okay. So, it's funny that our grandparents and great grandparents, they grew up in a world cash is king. And we all, and they were just so attuned to this idea that if somebody steals your wallet, breaks into your house, they take your cash, it's gone. And so they built a lifestyle where they got very clever, you know, how to store it, how to think about it. And there's certain inefficiencies with that. Then we move to this digital world, the world of credit cards, the world of bank accounts, the world of PayPal. And then we just started building these consumer expectations of if identity theft happens or if somebody hacks into my account, I can pick up a phone, I can call somebody, and somebody's going to be on the other side of it to listen to my story, hear me bitch, and make things right. There's a big cost to that. There's hundreds of billions of dollars of fraud cost to the global financial system every year. And... That system has a huge amount of trade-offs in that you lose control. You know, just like this, this piece of cash that our grandparents lived with and they enjoyed, um, at the end of the day, you know, they had total dominion of that. You didn't have civil asset forfeiture. You didn't have freezing of assets, these types of things. You, the country went bad. You could convert that into silver or to something else. People couldn't come in and just seize money out of your bank account, like put in a wealth tax, Cypriot style or something like that. So... What cryptocurrencies have done is they've effectively taken the rules that our grandparents live with and they've updated them to live in a digital world. And the problem is instead of having just the occasional pickpocket who can reach into your pants and take your wallet, you now have a global pickpocket. So you have people everywhere and scammers everywhere. And they're really, really good at trying to separate you from your money. And they're very clever and uh, they do all kinds of things. I've personally been impacted. For example, I have cell phone and uh, hackers got enough social information about me. They called my cell phone company and convinced my cell phone company to convert my SIM to their SIM. So I lost access to my own cell phone from my own cell phone company. And then once they had access to my cell phone, they tried really hard to break into all my accounts. Now, Michael uh, Turpin, He's a very famous guy in the cryptocurrency space. Not only had this happen to him, he lost millions of dollars from it as a result of that backdoor that at and in, in his case, uh, did that. So even the best of us can be subject to theft, fraud, scams, and abuse. So the question is, what do we do about it? Well, my view is it's a really bad idea at the protocol level to say, Bob, you're in control. You get to decide right and wrong who gets their money back or this committee gets to decide that. It's a bizarre, terrible thing. Uh, I think EOS is a great example of of that. You know, we already have deciders. There's judges, there's police, there's a judicial branch of every government. Even Mickey Mouse governments like North Korea, they have some notion of a judicial branch. So there's already people who get to say, I'm empowered with deciding whether you get something back or not. So instead, what you need to do is say, look, the base protocol is like cash, but you know what I can do with cash? I can convert it into other forms. And when I do that, I get added trade-offs. Maybe I lose some control, but now I get consumer protection. There's insurance, there's multi-sig, there's custodial accounts and so forth. So what we ought to do is instead of saying, can we build a governance system and have 21 people or whoever get down and and have to investigate what the hell to do with a global financial system that they're not qualified for and not legally able to actually do. Instead of trying to reinvent 2,000 years of human government, let's just instead open up the free market and let insurance markets form, custodial markets form, multi-sig solutions form, and so forth, and that'll give you finer grain control. I mentioned the exchange addresses. There's no reason we couldn't open that up. 
and you could do your own reversals and store your money this way. You could write smart contracts to put custom terms and conditions. And if you don't want to do it, people can template it, create it, and then you can use it to store funds accordingly. And best practices can form. Now, what do you do about scams? Well, that's consumer fraud. And nothing will replace your government's judicial branch. If Bob says, I'm going to give you X, and Bob doesn't do it, you can sue Bob. And if Bob is a real criminal, Bob can go to jail for that. And the rules haven't changed just because we're doing a different mechanism. You know, people stole cars back in 1915. It was a different type of car than the Lamborghini they steal today, but it's the same act. And the justice system is more than capable of dealing with these things. Now, whether it can do it or can't do it is contingent on the rule of law, the society you live in, and the powers you've given that particular branch. So you as a consumer have to self-protect ultimately. So you have to ask yourself, what can I do to have good hygiene to protect myself from scams? And for the most part, most people aren't falling for the Nigerian Prince scam. Most people aren't following, following for the person who knocks on your door and says, donate money to the orphans or these types of things. With the exception of people who lack the cognitive capabilities to take care of themselves. And this is one area where cryptocurrencies have a big failing. My grandfather on my mom's side, he's in his mid eighties, and uh, we've had to work real hard with him to lock down his accounts because he's become a target for scammers. Uh, people will call him up and sell him gold coins that really aren't worth very much or ask him for political donations. And for a long time, he was one of the most savvy people ever. He was a lineman who worked his way up to be a vice president of a cable company and got 19 patents, including one on the cable box. Uh, he was a brilliant guy, and he, and he never had a college education, but yet despite that, he was able to retire uh, very well off. But the problem is that he's gotten to the point in his life where he no longer has the ability to handle complex financial decisions. And people know that, they smell it, and they're trying to take advantage of them. So we as the family had had to come together and help them out. Uh, and a lot of families have to do this for the, the older and the infirmed. Um, my grandfather on my other side, uh, my, uh, my dad's dad, uh, he has Alzheimer's. And again, he was a, a brilliant man. He was a surgeon at OBGYN, delivered 4,000 kids over his career, uh, and uh, had land up in Montana and land in Hawaii. And unfortunately, as his Alzheimer's got worse and worse, his financial decision-making got worse. And a lot of that nest egg that he had constructed to give him a good retirement got um, absorbed away. The problem with cryptocurrencies is they take things that are like bank accounts, which normally do have some protections and allow other people to come in and when it's a social problem, resolve it, especially on a family side. And they treat it like cash. And if grandpa has Alzheimer's and he's buried a lot of money somewhere on a 600 acre estate, you're never going to find that. You, good luck. And it's the same problem with cryptocurrencies. You know, what happens when they forget the private keys? This is one of the challenges that we as an ecosystem have to think really carefully about. And unfortunately, for this particular asset class, there may exist realities and scenarios where uh, these things just don't work out so well and people lose their money. In other cases, like with Hal Finney, who was in Bitcoin very early, uh, he was able because he knew he was going to die and he knew he was declining to protect himself and his family as best he could. But even they were actually victims of ransom attacks and scammers and other such things. And they had great preparation. So it's a great conversation to have. Uh, from our part, we can build great devices and smart contract standards and special transaction types. Uh, but at the end of the day, it is something where third-party services are going to have to interact with the protocol to provide that level of coverage, which actually stumbles into another point about what is the role of the financial institution in a post-cryptocurrency world. I see a lot of people, usually people that want to separate you from your money, run around and say cryptocurrencies are going to kill all the banks, kill all the insurance companies, kill all the financial institutions. No. Because at the end of the day, financial institutions exist not to take money from you. They do that today a lot because they've been perverted. But in the beginning, they were about saying, you have something and I'm going to help you protect and transform that thing you have uh, over the arc of your life so that you get less risk, 
you can grow it more and you get more certainty for you and your children and your children's children. They're a service provider. That's the, at the end of the day, the heart of what the financial industry should be doing as a good industry. So the financial industry, as it learns more about cryptocurrencies, is it's just another asset class. It's just another tool. And maybe they're not going to be as large part of the economy and make as much money as they used to, but there's going to be some subset of people who are quite clever who can adopt special types of processes that can take care of my grandfather and my other grandfather as we grow older and as life gets more complicated and harder. Uh, and our goal is to preserve the fruits of our labors as opposed to growing the fruits of our labors and to make sure that those fruits can be transferred from one generation to the next generation in a responsible and well thought out way. And it turns out that they have much, much, much better palette to work with, much better canvas to work with uh, than they have with the legacy financial system where you only have five tools and they all kind of look like hammers. Here they have code. They can actually do amazing things. So I'm actually very excited to see how we can go back to the baronial age and go back to the way things used to work in the financial industry where you have a relationship with somebody and that person's adding value either in that they're protecting you or that they're making transactions better or more comprehensive or that they're making your ability to transfer what you have to someone else uh, occur with less friction. So... Um, it's a great question, though, and thank you for asking it. Can AI and ML in the crypto sphere or Cardano specifically? Yeah, so I get a lot of AI questions, and I get a lot of questions about machine learning, and like, what's the role for this stuff in the cryptocurrency space? So, you know, Apache has a project called Flink, uh, and there's this notion of complex event processing, and, um, and the financial world is very sophisticated these days. And so uh, one thing I, you can Google this, it's actually a great anomaly. So somebody hacked, I think it was Reuters Twitter feed, uh, one of the news agencies, and as a spoof, they tweeted, White House attacked, Obama injured en route to hospital. Now, the moment that they did that, the markets went, Pff! not minutes, not hours, but like literally seconds after that tweet came out. No human being could have possibly reacted to that. So you have to ask yourself, what happened? How did the markets react like that? Well, what happened is that people write all these algorithms, and these algorithms are complex events, and basically they watch all these sources of data and they weave them together into a mosaic, and that mosaic forms a picture. And that picture is retrodicted to many different things, and it's, it's uh, an opinion on how reality ought to be. And it's only as good as the inputs that are going into it. Now, what's so incredibly interesting to the financial industry about the blockchain space is one of the, if you look at historical failures, like for example, the 2008 financial crisis or the long-term capital crisis, almost always these things come from not having a consolidated data feed, not having a consolidated marketplace or tape, in that some subset of people were doing business in a way that was opaque to the broader community, and that was still somehow connected to the rest of the marketplaces, in that if their business went sour, it would cascade and cause this huge failure in the system. So where AI and ML, I think, fit into the blockchain space is as more and more and more stuff goes from the legacy world into these consolidated tapes, into these universal ledgers that are all transparent to each other. For the first time ever, ever, we're going to have a situation where markets are going to actually have a fair game. It's not the game of, well, you know, Bob happens to be co-located next to the stock exchange and put his servers right inside our servers and... As a result, you can do high-frequency trading and do things on the micro or um, nanosecond to go ahead and get some statistical arbitrage, but more rather that we're all looking at the same data feeds and they're all kind of coming together and eventually getting consistent. And then AI and ML, they, they can come in and say, hey, uh, you know, what does all this mean? And what does that tapestry mean and so forth? So I don't think that those things are going to have a huge impact on the design of blockchains or in some way make our industry better. I think that it's just 
that those models now have a new input that for the first time ever is more holistic than the way the markets work before. And that's really exciting. And it's uh, something that I think will m give more resilience and stability. And it'll also give policymakers better anchors so that when they let, uh, they look at macro and micro prudential policy. see anything else we got here all right let's do one more and then i gotta get going let's make it a good one charles what do you envision the world will be like in 20 years <laughs> that's uh yeah, that's going to be a fun one to answer. Let's go down that road. So, you know, you have all these guys here called futurists. You know, and if I could go to university all over again and do everything all over again, I'd probably take more art classes. I'd learn how to draw and certainly learn how to paint. I love Bob Ross. But damn, I, I had to be a futurist. Go get a PhD in that, man. So it's like, what is your job? It's like, I write books about where we're all going. It's like, what if you're right? It's like, well, I'm a visionary. What if you're not right? Well, you already bought the book. <laughs> So, so at least I can feed myself. Um, and uh, there's these these guys that uh, that write these types of things. Um, I would hope that 20 years from now, the world looks, you know, we could kind of break the world into three different buckets. And I would hope that we make progress in those three different buckets. One, I would hope that we understand that the way the world works is a product of narratives. It's a product of fictions that we all agree to believe in, like the nature of money. Why is this worth anything? Because we said so. Well, who's we, the U.S. government? Who's the U.S. government? Us, the American people. And we collectively have come together. We could change everything. We could hold a new constitutional convention. We could rename our money Bubuchar. We could do whatever the hell we wanted to do. But collectively, we just came up with this, and that's the way it is. And people believe it's worth products and services, so it gets value, right? Beliefs are very powerful things. They create religions, sometimes good ones, sometimes bad ones. Uh, they, they alter how you live your life, the types of things you eat. For example, somewhere along the way, we started convincing people that high carb, low fat was a good idea. It didn't do anything to our heart disease or our diabetes rate. In fact, quite the opposite. They just kept going up. But Ansel Keys did that. And now we have all this food where we strip out all the fat and we put in tons of sugar to augment the taste. And lo and behold, people can't lose weight and they get fatter and fatter. So narratives can really have a huge impact on people's perception of reality, how they live their life and what they do. I would hope that people realize that narratives are malleable. And in the next 20 years, we gain better cognitive tools and social tools to be able to alter those narratives in a way that is better for everybody. Um, we produce so much. You know, for example, there's this idea that America's manufacturing days are behind it. It surprises a lot of people to know that we manufacture more things in the United States in 2018 than we did in the year 2000 or the year 1990 or in the year 1980 or 1970 or 1960. Yet people seem to believe that we make less because there's physically less people involved in that particular industry. And as we mechanize and we automate and as things get more advanced, we get even more productive capacity. So why is it the fact that despite the fact that we're getting more efficient, we have more productive capacity, we still have people that live on less than a dollar a day. And we still have people that are going through a real hard time. You know, so I would hope that people realize that if you just change the narrative a little bit, like we did when we went from communism is the solution in Africa and all these governments just got really raped and destroyed from it, or deep injection of foreign aid and foreign control is the only way to get people out of po poverty to like a market oriented approach where you empower people to do their own things. We saw in 20 years, you know, places that were the canonical place where people starved to death to actually having a lower infant mortality rate than Europe had in 1950s. So the first thing I would hope is that because of the internet, the intellectual dark web and all these new capabilities that more and more people wake up to self offering their own narratives trust but verify, using critical thinking, talk to people, look at things, get more data driven. And over the next 20 years, we have a tremendous opportunity to break up that 
cartel and to basically be in charge of the way we live our lives and the way we perceive reality. Second, uh, there really is a great silent medical revolution. And it's a revolution that focuses on cures instead of treatments. And this is something where you have to think carefully about financial incentives. One of the reasons why the pharmaceutical industry works the way it does and uh, the healthcare industry is the way it is, is that you get paid a lot to treat and you get paid a lot to manage, but you don't get paid a lot to cure. If you know somebody comes in and you fix their back and they say, wow, my back feels great. You know, it's like, great, you got a service fee for that. Even if it's a very high fee, somebody comes in and says, my back hurts. You say, here are some opiates. Here are some drugs for that. And by the way, you have to keep taking them or else the pain comes back. You make money from that person for the rest of your life as a pharmaceutical industry. So there are some in the industry that invest very heavily into treatment, but not so much into cures. And if you look at things like cancer, things like neurodegenerative disorders, autoimmune disorders, all these things, there's a huge body of things, regenerative biology and regenerative medicine, immunotherapy, where we're starting to learn that you can just have the body heal itself. The body built itself from nothing, you know, just two cells came together and became this huge thing. So the body can certainly regenerate itself and repair itself. There are some cancer vaccines coming on the marketplace. There are some miracles uh, where basically they say, hey, you know, your own immune system can treat it instead of chemotherapy or this. Um, similarly, we're actually starting to see meaningful progress in growing organs, regrowing limbs, and so forth. Now, that I think is probably one of the greatest achievements in the history of humanity. And we're on a collision course to get there. Uh, there's just tons of great scientists and great institutes that are working on it. Unfortunately, all the wars the United States has had and the wars we've had has, uh, all throughout the world have left millions and millions of amputees and millions of paralyzed people and people with permanent injuries. And those people are going to live a very long time, 60 years, 70 years beyond when they got the injury. And the healthcare system needs to treat that. Second, the dementia crisis where neurodegenerative disorders are coming is, is horrendously expensive to deal with. So there's just massive amount of government money and industry money coming in. And we're moving from a treatment-based economy more towards an idea of cure-based economy, where through some combination of perturbing your diet and exercise and other such things, and some perturbation of uh, things like CRISPR and stem cell research and so forth, somehow, some way, we're going to stumble into a reality where we can tune things to make things better. Uh, so that gets me profoundly excited. And I think over the next 20 years, we're really going to start seeing great progress there. And it's I'm going to live and you're going to live to see the first person get up out of a wheelchair uh, or first person to regrow their legs or first person to have a heart transplant where they grew the heart in a Petri dish in a bioreactor as opposed to transplanting it from one person to the next. Uh, it brings up a lot of ethical questions and it brings up a lot of uh, you know, societal questions of, well, what happens when people start living a lot longer? And a lot of the things that used to off us are now we're kept around. And what do we do about overpopulation? And what do we do about resource allocation? Because these therapies probably aren't going to be cheap. And it's going to be one of the great challenges of the 21st century. Finally, uh, this is the first century, I think, where we're going to create a new form of life. Uh, we're going to both be able to bring back life that has been lost. And we're going to be able to create different types of life defined by cognition. So in terms of bringing back, uh, in short order, we're probably going to bring back the woolly mammoth and other animals like that. There's even documentaries on YouTube you can watch, but it's only a matter of time before de-extinction happens. And in fact, from policy perspective, so many animals go extinct every year. It's much better business if you're an entrepreneur looking for the next big business to start to go to a government and say, let your animals go extinct and we'll pay a subscription to us uh, and we'll go ahead and de-extinct them when you have the resources to do that than to try to conserve them and prevent them from going extinct. As it's just, it's a battle that's too uphill to fight, but that might be a better way of doing it. Which then brings up a question of, well, we can bring back the woolly mammoth, but there were over 20 different species of humans, of uh, Homo erectus and Neanderthals and so forth, what if we could bring them back? What does that mean? What rights would they have? And is that a good idea or not? So there's a humongous intellectual challenge, ethical challenge, societal challenge in that, uh, that we're going to be able to do that. 
And we're not really prepared as a society for the consequences of that. We're kind of used to letting things go instead of gaining things back. Second, we're creating artificial life in that we're creating these computer programs which are so tremendously complex that at some point uh, they're going to be able to imitate human cognition. And at some point they probably will have their own cognition. What that means is difficult. And the problem is that these systems are mirrors. That's the most dangerous part of them. We adopt mental defenses and insulations about ourselves to protect ourselves from who we really are. We tell ourselves lies and we believe those lies and we create social lies. I think Trump is the best in the world at that, to think that I am X. But the problem is when you have something like the laws of physics or a cryptocurrency or an AI, it can look at you with a penetrating gaze that is um, so profoundly intrusive that all your fictions go away and who you really are gets exposed. You know how much you lie. Uh, you know how much you kind of procrastinate. And that's a profoundly uncomfortable thing. And this can be done on the individual level and on the social level. And when you start giving commands to such creatures, to such entities, like let's protect the environment or let's prevent the world from descending into chaos. The reality is the optimal solution may not be a solution that's in the favor of you individually. So then you have to ask yourself, well, how do we address and deal with that? And that's another one of the great challenges of the 21st century is the creation of life that is a mirror that uh, will show us things we don't want to see and at some point will be able to evolve at a rate much faster than us and as a consequence have capabilities we don't have. Now, if we're smart and humble, we could recognize that this is the greatest tool in human history uh, in that we've created a living God to give ourselves ideas and force ourselves into modes of cognition that collectively are good for us. We've created the parent we've always wanted to have. If we're dumb, uh, we will use these tools for purposes of war and greed, and we'll lose control of them, and eventually they'll turn on us and destroy us. So the 21st century is is really going to be the, the make-or-break moment, in my mind, for the human race. We, thanks to the hard work of the people who came before us, now have the paintbrush of reality in our hands, and we get to decide basically whether we're going to extend beyond where we're at as a race and go into the stars and be something grand, or we get to decide whether we erase ourselves from history. The prior generation got close to this with the advent of nuclear weapons, and we got very close to annihilation twice, once during the Cuban Missile Crisis where we were literally one key turn away from extinction, and then another time during the 1980s where an astute colonel recognized that there was a computer failure and that the United States wasn't launching missiles at the Soviet Union and violated direct orders and violated his training to avoid nuclear Armageddon. We were that close twice to extinction as a species. And now the 21st century is going to give us the potential to do it again, but this time do it in a way that um, we really don't have a chance to survive. So my hope for the next 20 years is that we recognize that the fictions we have, the narratives that we have can be rewritten, and we recognize they can be rewritten in a way that gives us a higher probability of embracing these amazing tools, the tools that allow us to live far longer than any humans have ever lived in history, and the tools that will allow us to understand more about ourselves than we've ever been able to understand before, and to merge with those tools in such a way that we really can get to the next level in our evolution the dystopian reality is that we might not get there. That's the challenge every generation has. That's why I don't think so much about material things like money or you know, what cryptocurrency is going to win or so forth, uh, because at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. It's like saying, well, does Rockefeller, did he really care that Standard Oil was broken up? Okay, his company got broken up and still rich. He's you know, still relevant. But at the end of the day, he was still subject to the times, to the same frailties that you and me have, to the same diseases you and me have, and he still died. And the challenges that we look to in the future 
are existential in nature. And uh, we each have to do our part collectively, globally, not on the nation state level, but globally, to actually have a meaningful impact on that. So those are the things I think about a lot. And I see cryptocurrencies as a great awakening to start getting people to understand that they actually have control over the narrative of the world. And then once you've gone down that road, you start waking up and realizing that there's more and more and more and more you personally actually have control over. And that you've been told all these lies that you're worthless and meaningless and you can't do anything. Everybody's special in their own regard. And everybody has a choice. That colonel grew up in the Soviet system as a Soviet military officer with the commissars and the gulags. He was born during the time of Stalin. There was no greater system in the world to dehumanize you and tell you you couldn't do something. But then he sat there and said, you know what? It's my call and I'm not going to end the world. And I don't care about the consequences. And you're no different than him. So uh, I would hope over the next 20 years, more and more people awaken to that. The technology is on autopilot. It's going to happen. There's too many brilliant people working on it. Uh, and uh, if we get it done right, we're going to live in a really good world. And let's try to make that happen. Anyway, thank you guys so much for listening. This is a bit more philosophical of an AMA, less Cardano related, but uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you so much.